I want to begin by thanking the town hall, the foundations that have arranged this evening, the Christina Anya Foundation, and our partner in India, the Calcutta Odan Foundation. And you'll be the one who's been persuading me to try and make it to San Sebastian. Um, it's not the closest place to reach, but I'm here and I'm very happy to return. I've been here before, and I'm particularly happy to be in this amazing building um, with so much dedication, so much spirit, so much brilliance to put up those structures. I think one of the issues we face is the fact that for 200 years, we've created a worldview that has denied that the earth is alive, that the earth is a self-organized evolutionary system, that every person on earth is an intelligent being, and women are intelligent even though they were treated as if they have no minds, as if they have no brains. I remember I had to do 150 years of a college in America, and I went to the archives to, to read about the founding of that college, and it was very interesting when the college was being founded, the debates were, how can you educate women? Because if their brains grow, their uterus will shrink. And the primary function of women is as reproductive machines. So we can't put women's childbearing capacity at risk by having them think as if they weren't thinking when they weren't in university. The earth, as Gaia, is now known to be a self-organized living system. It was a NASA scientist, James Lovelock, who was totally taken up by the fact that the earth was regulating her temperature, just like our body regulates its temperature, her climate systems, to brilliance, and the Earth has evolved over 4.5 billion years and evolved in such rich diversity, no other planet has these living systems, species, and a biosphere designed to sustain life and create the conditions of its own life. In just 200 years, humanity which has an evolution of 2.8 million. And in the 2.8 million, we weren't messing up the planet. But in the last 200 years, we've disrupted the Earth systems. At the same time, we've driven species to extinction at a thousand times the rate of normal disappearance of species. And to achieve all this, there has been a colonizing of the entire world, a colonizing of cultures. The fossil fuel age, 200 years, that's all. In the long evolutionary history of the planet is based on burning up every year 20 million years of nature's work in creating fossilized carbon. She worked over 600 million years to take plants and living systems which were buried down underground, and she turned them into oil and gas. And I always say, if it was put underground, it was meant to be underground. The soil should stay. The, the oil should stay under the soil. It's not that we discovered fossil fuels 200 years ago, they've been used, but in tiny quantities by Native Americans, by the Burmese, all over the world in small amounts for lighting, 
for lamps. But it was the age of the robber barons, that's what they were called, that led to this expansion. The coal, first in England, and then oil in America. And oil has totally changed the geopolitics of this planet. Every war going on today, every war, is a war based on oil. If you look at the Middle East, it doesn't look like anything that the Middle East was before oil. Every line is an artificial line just to carve out oil empires. Current wars, whether it be Iraq or Syria, are for oil. But that obvious war is hidden by the deeper war, which is a war against the planet's systems. So I call climate change a metabolic disease because every self-organized system is able to maintain its system. As healthy bodies, our bodies are able to deal with carbohydrates and sugar. But when the metabolic disease of diabetes takes over, then we cannot deal with sugar. Climate change for me is to the planet what the chronic diseases of our times are to our human body. Now, 75% of the diseases that are chronic, chronic means they'll be with you for a lifetime. If you get a cold, it lasts for three, four days. Infectious diseases go away. Chronic diseases stay for a lifetime. And increasingly, science is tracing them to the same sources that I understood to be the cause of 50% of the greenhouse gases in my book, Soil Not Oil. The three main greenhouse gases, first is carbon dioxide. When you build 20 mil, burn 20 million years annually, you're going to have a buildup of carbon in the atmosphere way beyond the planet's capacity. But much more important, the same actions that are burning that carbon, the fossil carbon, are also destroying the living carbon in our forests. I have traveled to Brazil. I have traveled to Argentina, where entire forests have been destroyed in the Amazon, Monsanto's GMO soya traded by Cargill illegally with a port created without permission. It was cutting down the forests. Indigenous people were being attacked and I remember there was a nun because we are in a convent, a nun called Dorothy, Sister Dorothy, who was shot dead because she was supporting the indigenous people against the illegal cultivation of soil. Now, every time the rainforest is chopped, the Earth's capacity to reabsorb carbon, in a way, the Earth's lungs are basically being destroyed. So you're emitting more and destroying the Earth's capacity to absorb. Every time you do chemical farming, you are not just destroying the plants and soil's capacity to reabsorb the carbon dioxide, you're destroying the planet's capacity to reabsorb the nitrogen because now you're using synthetic chemical fertilizers which are 300 times more damaging to the climate metabolic system. 300 times more deadly. Methane is the third greenhouse gas also comes from this industrial system of farming based on fossil fuels and chemicals. Every chemical in agriculture is based on fossil fuels. Chemical fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizer, for one kilogram uses two liters of diesel. And energy used during fertilizer manufacture equivalent to 191 billion liters of diesel in the year 2000. And by the time it's 2030, it's expected to rise to 277 billion. What's the technology 
of making these synthetic fertilizers, the same factories that made ammunition and explosives in Hitler's Germany the same factories and the same technology of atmospheric nitrogen fixing by burning fossil fuels. This nitrogen is killing the air with nitrous oxide. It's killing the soil. It's killing the water. The dead zones in the oceans are spreading. You just have to look at the maps of the dead zones because all this extra nitrogen is running into the oceans and killing ocean life. And it's not working to do what it was claimed to do, improve soil fertility and improve agricultural productivity. Our studies in our country are showing that actually there's such a huge decline. In the year 1970, for one kilogram of chemical fertilizer, we grew 13 kilograms of grain. Now, for one kilogram, we are producing three kilograms. That loss of 10 kilograms is because the soil has died. So basically, greenhouse gases are damaging the air, but the same activity of industrial agriculture is killing the soil, desertifying the soil, killing the water, we are using 3, 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food. All my studies in Punjab on the Green Revolution and our studies on our farm show that we use much less water when you use native varieties of seeds and when you do organic farming. Because when you do organic farming, you have far more organic matter in the soil. And the organic matter in the soil holds water, but it also generates fertility. In our valley, we've done a 20-year study recently comparing chemical farms with organic farms. The organic carbon has increased 99% in organic farms. It has gone down 14% in the chemical farms. Nitrogen in the soil has increased 100% in the organic farms it's gone down 22% in the chemical farms because the soil organisms that actually produce nitrogen, the earthworms and other bacteria, they are being killed by the chemicals. Diversity itself is the most efficient way to use the energy of the sun to create the biosphere. In effect, green plants are plants that fix carbon and turn carbon dioxide into the oxygen we breathe while producing everything we need, all the food, all the fiber, through that miraculous process of photosynthesis. And the earth herself evolved diversity. Her tendency is to increase the diversity and we as humans have increased diversity. Till the chemical cartel, I call them the poison cartel because they started in Hitler's wars. The same group of people who are today controlling seed used to be the ones that made the gases for the concentration camps. The nerve gases called Xylon B, they are the precursors of pesticides the poison gases, and there used to be a cartel that was tried after the wars. Its name was IG Farben. Linked to this German cartel were all the American companies that are in the food area. The Dow's, the DuPont's, the Monsanto's. Monsanto actually had a joint company with Bayer called Mobe. They have just merged again. The European Competition Commission has given a go-ahead to the merger. Americans have go given go-ahead to the merger. India's Competition Commission was absolutely refusing. They rejected the application once. The second time over, they were very reluctant 
two days before buyer's annual general assembly at which shareholders come, India was arm twisted to approve this merger. So now you have a poison cartel of three who are primarily responsible for the climate damage. They are primarily responsible for the species extinction. If you've been following in recent months in Europe, 75% of all insects have died. 75% of the birds have died in 20 years and every scientific study is identifying industrial, chemical, fossil fuel agriculture as the driving force of species extinction, the same force that is giving us greenhouse gases. We have bred for diversity. And women were the seed keepers till this cartel took control of seed. I started my work on seed saving and I started Navdanya, the movement, um, in, after 1987 when I was invited to a meeting on the new biotechnologies, on the GMOs. And the companies that had brought us poisons and created the greenhouse gases were now saying we need to merge and become bigger. And the way to become bigger, besides becoming small, smaller numbers but larger in power, is to have patents on seed. And they saw in genetically engineered organism, GMOs, a way to pretend that they had become inventors of life. That's why I often say GMO for Monsanto means God move over. We are now going to pretend to be the creators. That's when I decided to save seeds. That's when I started to work with my government to ensure our laws do not allow patenting of seed because we don't invent life. Life makes itself. That's what self-organized systems are about. I'm very happy to say that in spite of Monsanto's continued efforts to topple our laws, on the 7th of May this year, in the Supreme Court, we had another round of victory against Monsanto, who was trying to basically challenge the laws, and the Supreme Court said, no, we will not accept your case for turning down that law. We're going to hear this. That doesn't mean Monsanto's attempts to corrupt will stop, nor will our efforts and our dedication to protect biodiversity. When I started saving seeds, we were just saving seeds so that they wouldn't be patented, they wouldn't be genetically modified, and farmers' ability to save and exchange seed would not be criminalized through patent law. That their freedom to save seed would be defended. In 1999, we had a terrible cyclone in Orissa. Three times the velocity came three miles inland. The salt water from the sea devastated the coast. We had saved salt tolerant seeds and we were able to rejuvenate the agriculture of Orissa. 2004, you might have heard of the tsunami. The government of Tamil Nadu said, we can't do agriculture for five years, too much salt on the land. I had gone for rehabilitation work and I said, no, we can because we have salt tolerant seeds. So we took two truckloads of salt tolerant seed from the farmers of Orissa to the farmers of Tamil Nadu. These climate resilient seeds have been evolved by farmers and peasants. There are now attempts to appropriate these seeds through what I call biopiracy. And how are they doing it? I have fought in my life the piracy of neem, a beautiful tree that gives us natural pest control. My mother, my grandmother used neem leaves to protect our silk, our wool. 
1994, a patent was taken by the US government. We challenged it. In 1984, after the Bhopal disaster, I had started a campaign, no more Bhopals, let's plant neem, because the pesticide plant had killed the people. 10 years later, we find it's patented. We fought that case for 11 years, and it was three women. I was in India, I couldn't come to Europe all the time. The head of the European Greens in Parliament of Europe and the head of EFOAM, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movement. We joined hands. We had no money. We found a lawyer who would give his time pro bono, a patent lawyer from Switzerland. And 11 years we fought the biggest superpower of the world and one of the biggest chemical companies and we defeated them. 11 years it took. But women with love and solidarity were a bigger force. My valley, Dehradun, is famous for the basmati. Today at lunch, everyone at lunch was eating a basmati dish. A company in Texas claimed to have invented the basmati. Before that case, we had them drop their patent. We have old wheat varieties, ancient varieties, which do not give gluten allergies. Monsanto patented Indian wheat for the gluten allergy market. We challenged that. Again, I came to the European Patent Office and they were forced to drop it. Now, the same companies, which I remind you again, is a cartel of three. Bayer merging with Monsanto, Dow merging with DuPont, Syngenta merging with ChemChina. They have taken thousands of patents on climate resilient seeds. Have they invented these seeds? No, they can't. They've pirated them. And what they do is they have a software program called Athlete. They don't, actually it's a company in Israel that has it. And it takes all the drought tolerant seeds of corn, for example, and runs through them. And I should read this out to you because it's important to know what's happening to our seeds in this time of climate change. So this is what this company, Evogene, says. It has eight million express sequences and 400,000 propriety gene clusters in 30 plant species. And it says, we use vast amount of available genomic data, public data, public knowledge of farmers' varieties that have been bred for drought tolerance, soil tolerance, flood tolerance. We use vast amount of available genomic data, mostly public, to rapidly reach a reliable limited list of candidate key genes with high relevance to a target trait of choice. Allegorically, the athlete platform could be viewed as a machine that is able to choose 50 to 100 lottery tickets from amongst hundreds with the high likelihood that the winning ticket will be included among them. This is not breeding. This is not knowledge. This is gambling for a monopoly on the very source of life, the seed. And the only way to stop this is to continue the fight we started from Navdanya, no patents on seed no patents on life. It's an ethical imperative, an ecological imperative, a political imperative, and an economic imperative. Economic because 300,000 Indian farmers have been driven to suicide since 1995, when globalization allowed these companies to enter India. And most of these suicides are in the area where there is BT cotton. 95% of the BT cotton seed is controlled by Monsanto. They shot the price up by 80,000%. We fought many cases to bring the price down, but that excessive royalty collection, illegal because they don't have a patent on seed, and the failure of the seed has meant farmers are in deep debt. And when they're desperate and the agents of the company that sells the chemicals and the seeds 
comes to the farmer and says, you haven't paid back, your seeds are now my seeds. Uh, you, no, your land is now my land. That day the farmer will borrow one last time to get a bottle of pesticide and drink it in their field and take their lives. Case after case after case. So at one level, this genocide doesn't stop. The same forces that are poisoning the planet, creating greenhouse gases, are also poisoning our bodies. In Europe, you have an intense debate around glyphosate, Roundup. A new study was just done by an Italian research institute that showed that even within so-called safe limits, it is killing the gut microbiome. And this to me is the ultimate wake up call for humanity to recognize that A, we are not separate from the rest of life, we are not separate from nature, that we are part of nature and we are part of a living web of life because in each of you, only 10% of you are human cells. 90% are microbes and bacteria, beneficial bacteria that maintain your life. 100 trillion of them in your gut. That is why the gut is now being called the gut microbiome. Same processes of climate damage are processes of our health damage. All chronic diseases can now be traced back to the damage of the gut microbiome whether they be neurological epidemics of people having autism. In America, one in 35 children has autism. And if you look at how the graph is predicted to grow by 2025, one in two American children will be autistic. Look at the way Alzheimer's is growing. Look at the way Parkinson's is growing. Look at the way cancer is spreading. Look at the way all kinds of diseases related to the malfunctioning of our body are spreading. Now is the time to make very conscious and clear choices about our future. Now the same poison cartel is of course very ready to construct a non-future. I call it a non-future because they have already damaged 75% of the climate. 75% of the soils are desertified, eroded. 24 billion tons annually is being eroded because of industrial farming. And as soils are desertified, you can't farm anymore. You become a refugee. The two big cases of Syria and Nigeria are in our report, Terra Viva, on our soils, our commons, our future. And we were writing it when those boats were coming across the Mediterranean and sinking. And we wanted to understand why are people escaping their homes? Turns out in 20, 2009, there was a severe drought in Syria. Because of the green revolution, Syria's water had been mined the soils had been damaged, and with one extreme drought related to climate change, a million Syrian farmers became refugees and moved to the city. From 2009 to 2011, there were protests of farmers in the cities of Syria. 2011, those engaged in war found this a good opportunity, and you can see what the mess we have, except that half of Syria is now living in refugee camps, half of Syria's population. According to the UN, if we don't change this model, we're going to have up to 700 million refugees by 2030. Take Africa, you just keep listening to the word Boko Haram. Boko Haram didn't exist before 2009. Same severe drought, 
Meantime, for 20 years, commercial commodified farming had diverted the rivers that feed Lake Chad to agriculture, industrial agriculture. Lake Chad used to be 22,000 square kilometers. Now it has shrunk. The farmers, the pastoralists, the fishermen are all in conflict for the shrinking water. So happens that the farmers are Christians and the pastoralists are Muslim. It's a conflict over resources, but it's made to look like an issue of religion. And now we have the extremism that has grown. I train in our National Defense College. And the year I was giving them a talk on climate change, there was a brigadier from Nigeria. And he got up and said, you are so right about the ecological roots of the conflicts in Nigeria. No amount of military action will solve this problem. Only ecological renewal will. Only ecological renewal will bring down conflicts. 45% conflicts today are related to destruction of the land and, as I said, oil. We move out of fossil fuel agriculture and the dependence on oil, we create a bigger chance for peace. And what are the poison makers planning, the fossil fuel derived poison makers planning right now? Monsanto, two, three years ago, bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation. So they want to control climate data and sell it to farmers as a commodity. They bought up the world's biggest soil data corporation. They have agreements with the machinery industry to put spyware, and I'm not saying anything that I haven't found on Monsanto's website. They put spyware with the tractors. The so-called spyware picks up the data of the soil. It can't pick up the data on the mycorrhizal fungi and the bacteria. It picks up data of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium sends those signals back to St. Louis. Monsanto packages this through what they call big data and digital farming and sells it back to farmers as a commodity. So you will see the rush of soil data commodification. They're now talking about big data as the new oil. Well, if we've had problem with the last oil, fossil fuel, we are already having big problems with big data. You can see what Facebook did by selling the data to Cambridge Analytica that then manipulated elections. And just like oil needs extraction, whereas organic farming needs giving back, that's the big difference. One is based on the law of return and one is based on the law of extraction. In the same way, the data extracted by Facebook and analyzed through algorithms and big data processing by Cambridge Analytica is extraction. It's extraction of our mind. It's extraction of our relationships and friendships. It's extraction of messages of hate. Just like in organic farming, we give back to the soil and the land. In relationships of building community, we give back to each other. Relationships of love and solidarity are mutuality based on giving. Relationships of hate are what can be commodified. So if you look at what happened with Cambridge Analytica, they analyzed the data of the Facebook messages that had been mined, they call it data mining, from the circulation of social communication. And they took four hates. Hate for women, hate for blacks, hate for Muslims, and hate for migrants. This was then amplified into electoral messages and advertising, and that's why you have a particular kind of president sitting in White House. We could call him the first artificial intelligence president, elected by artificial intelligence and not by the people. Monsanto's talking about farming without farmers, bigger and bigger tractors, more and more spyware. The head of their 
Artificial Intelligence Division has said there are two agencies that today need surveillance and spying. One is CIA, the other is Monsanto. Monsanto is now a European company called Bayer. European citizens and European movements have a whole new responsibility of dealing with the poison cartel. The most important way we can deal with them is exactly as was said in the beginning, from the ground up, create ecologically sustainable and just communities. We have such a long history of living with the land. There's a better way to live with the earth than to be at war with her. We don't need monocultures and militarized thought. We don't need monopolies because we can co-create with diversity. The issue of this monoculture mechanized mind that has brought us to this crisis is really a child of the so-called industrial and scientific revolution. At that point, it was said that nature is dead. Nature is there just to be exploited. It was said that we cannot but rape nature in order to control her. Boyle said, it is not till we destroy the reverence of the earth that we can have an empire of man over the earth. This idea that man is above the earth and the rest of us are lesser creatures, including women, including other cultures, including the microbes in our gut, of which, like I said, 90% of each of us is our gut microbe. 90% of us is others. We are the other. We cannot live in this assumption of negativity with respect to every other, whether it be the earth and a species or it be other cultures. As I've written in my book, Staying Alive, this reductionist mechanistic science is very much a patriarchal project. I've also written how it went hand in hand with criminalizing women's knowledge. Now is the time we need to make a shift to women-centered thinking, women-centered economies, women-centered ability to cooperate and co-create and co-produce with nature. These are amazing sources of the recognition of the intelligence that is pervasive. They are now calling our gut the second brain because there's more neurological activity going on in our gut than there is in what we call the old brain. Even this brain functions because of our gut because of the enzymes in our gut are not being produced by the bacteria through good food and biodiversity and they are being killed through the attack of chemicals. What we have is the absence of production of neurotransmitters, which is why neurological problems are growing. So if our gut is the second brain, the soil has organisms that are so hugely intelligent. New research on the mycorrhizal fungi is showing that it's a worldwide web under the soil. And it has far more communication going on than all of the internet. In one root of one plant, 680 miles of rootlets, each of them interacting intelligently. Because we work with soil, some scientists had come from Netherlands to visit Navdanya. They went back and did some research, and when I was in Netherlands for a meeting, they called me to see their findings. Till then, they hadn't thought of the soil and the seed together. So they germinated a wheat seed and put it into 
put the germinated seed into three kinds of soil. Organic soil, chemical soil, and soil with Roundup. In the organic soil, the roots just spread themselves very intelligently. Darwin called the roots of the plant the brain of the plant. And they went everywhere, and they shot out rootlets and rooters. In the case of the chemical soil, like a probe, they kept looking for something to find that was nourishment, because it was sterile soil. And it just kept jumping, like this, searching. And in the case of the Roundup and glyphosate soil, the root comes out from the germinated wheat and jumps back in repulsion, like it had been hit by a toxic shock. That is how other species are reacting to these poisons and chemicals and fossil fuel in our world. I say that we need to catch up with them to learn how to learn intelligently. We need to catch up with women to learn how to live non-violently in a different kind of power. For 200 years, with the fossil fuel empire that has given us climate change, we have been made to think that only violence is power when the reality is non-violent, peaceful power is the way nature works, is the way women work, is the way humanity can work across the board if we make an effort to cultivate that peace and that non-violent. A lot of scientists are saying, in the context of climate havoc, in the context of temperature rise, increasing buildup, that humanity will be extinct within the next century. Even the brilliant scientist Stephen Hawking said it, that within the next century we will be extinct. Or we can escape to another pro planet. The problem is there is no other living planet. Only this planet is a living planet. They're spending huge amounts to find water on Mars. Mr. Elon Musk, who makes cars, is financing his space program, SpaceX, he wants to send human beings to Mars, but he says the ticket is a billion dollars and only one million human beings will be able to fly. And he is so sweet. He actually says, and I will even arrange for food because I've figured out ways to transport Pizza Hut to Mars. I mean, if that's the level of your imagination of food is, not going to be a very healthy future. In any case, all of that transport of material will require a lot of fossil fuel which we are running out of. So there is no escape. Even if it was possible, it is highly irresponsible. No earthling, no earth citizen should trash this mother earth and say, now I'll escape. Women don't escape. Women don't create a mess. We constantly clean up. But we are not going to clean up other people's mess. We now everyone to join in production, consumption, and living, which doesn't create a mess. And this moment is not a choice between extinction and escape, as the brilliant scientists are saying, but they are still patriarchal in their thought. The real option is making peace with the earth, and taking care of the earth, because when we take care of her, she takes care of us. And with all the evidence I gave you about how with biodiversity, with soil, with giving back to the earth, we actually have solutions for climate mitigation, climate adaptation, climate resilience, and climate reversal, because climate change is nothing but the pollution of the atmosphere with excessive greenhouse gases, and in ecological ways, we have w means, scientifically established means, of taking that excess carbon dioxide and that excess nitrogen and putting it back into plants and soils to create a green earth, a living earth, which is what we've received, a living earth which we should pass on to future generations, and we have to be committed to a future that we cultivate, a future which is poison-free, We've launched a campaign, and I hope all of you will join Navdanya in this campaign, for a poison-free world by 2050. And I am absolutely sure your town will be leading 
in this transition to a fossil fuel free, climate stable, poison free future. The earth calls for it, our children deserve it. Thank you. <laughs>